Hello, the John Sitton Football Uncensored podcast with me, as always, Joe Mealing asking the questions. John, long time, no see, a couple of weeks have gone. Apologies, apologise for that, but uh, good oh, to mate. see you. Looking well. Yeah, you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're both in the same boat. I've tried. I've mm. tried to when people have been uh, giving me pelters on Twitter, but nice pelters. Um, you know, I've just tried to make them aware of the fact that we're, you know, we're working men. We we don't get paid. We've got no advertising revenue, and uh, we've been snowed under with our respective yeah. Uh, jobs. Yeah, but it's good. To, good to get a, a foothold back in it again. Hopefully, oh, definitely, mate. Yeah, and as I say, we'll we'll, we'll try and we'll do, we'll do one now, and then we'll. Um... As you, as, as you mentioned earlier, pick up the thread, um, maybe hopefully next week, um, because obviously games are coming thick and fast leading up to the Christmas period. So, oh, yeah. Do. This is where, um, well, not, not the title is decided, but certainly has a massive impact on, on the way in which the league pans out, doesn't it, the Christmas period, because there's so many games and you can you can make a lot of headway or you can lose a lot of headway, uh, depending on how it goes. Um, with that in mind, obviously... Um, I hate to remind you of this, but a, a big tip of yours for the season was Man United. You thought they'd do well. Obviously, they've struggled. Mm. Um, Ollie's got the sack. I actually went to the to the Watford game um, when they lost four oh. one. <laughs> Brilliant yeah. game, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Really did. You know, the hat, hairs stood up on the back of the neck. It was, it was an amazing game from a Watford perspective. But it just showed you how, how poor Man United were and how they weren't running for him and weren't. You know, uh, you could see him. He was lost on on, on the touchline and. Then, he went and clapped the fans and the fans were giving him, barracking him and all that. But um, he's gone. Uh, Ranjik has come in and obviously seemingly had a, an initial impact um, in his first game. Uh, certainly, uh, I know Carrick kind of won um, in, in, in the interim as a, as a, as a caretaker. Manchester United won in Europe as well. But yeah, but yeah Ranjik's come in. Another, another German, another hair. Hair Ranjik now to add to the list of, of Klopp. Um, too cool, and has and Hassan Hoot will be he's Austrian, but but worked under Ranić at uh, Red Bull Leipzig. So, yeah, um, what do you think? A good addition to the to the league, and and do you think he'll be successful when he's? Oh, it's only an interim period, but um, yeah, is he the sort of manager that Man United need? Obvious thing to say, but I think time will be the judge. <clears throat> what I, what I like to work, I mean, I think they'll let it. The like it was that long ago. It, it, the last podcast we did was uh, basically talking about not being able to defend Ollie anymore, and mm. then um, what happened happened, and it yeah. just seemed like the world was going on around him. Like you say, looked like he looked lost. Mm. It's what I said. It, it seemed to lack lack uh, presence and a sense of direction. I thought he handled it well when he took over, and I thought we'd done the right thing in the end, Carrick. He um he, he nicked a couple of results, and then he sort of bowed out gracefully and yeah. resigned and said like to, to him get on with it and then uh, basically I think the new guy's left with the rest of well his staff I see uh, feeling walking down the touchline with a clipboard uh, <laughs> when they yeah. when they nick they nick the one nil the other day yeah um, I don't know what it was something like 76 minute maybe or even yeah. later yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so time will be the judge it's, it's almost as if like now um, things have turned full cycle and it's like I've said before um, <clears throat> that's how on the downside I'll tip, I'll tip United to do something uh, almost now as if they've, people are thinking oh, they've, they've reinvented the game or reinvented the wheel inside the game but they, they haven't um, mm. because like you're looking at the way they're playing pressing from the front is something that just to enlighten people a little bit or, or give them um, it, it sort of prompt their memory it's something that was always done years ago when I was playing. And uh, I'll tell you, at the highest level, the governors at it in terms of pressing were uh, when the ball changed hands, what they now call transition. Mm-hmm. Um, I prefer, I still prefer to so say when the ball's changed hands, Li- Liverpool mm-hmm. always press from the front. And then it, and then, and then it, it was, it's like, um, so you're talking about um, coaches uh, sort of being a mentor in other coaches or being inspirational. Um, <clears throat> I had a near miss actually um, over the last two or three weeks with regards to someone re- reaching out to me. I thought something might come of it. So, but thus far, um, I'm, I'm still waiting. Uh, they actually contacted me late at night. Uh, so I, I, I don't know whether they, they was inebriated and thought better of it. But, um, 
what you're looking at, you're looking at people who go a little bit deeper and, and um, the one who took it to the next level, in my opinion, was uh, Terry Venables at Barcelona. Mm. Um, then he brought it back to QBR, uh, pressing from the front, but with regards to the placement of second, third, fourth players, and then the weight, the, the next line of players behind them, um, uh, he handed, handed it over to uh, when George Graham was youth coach at QBR. Um, and then obviously when he became Arsenal manager, they did it very well. Um, it's like I said, you've got two jo choices, Joe. You can either concede the, the, the ball and defend slightly deeper and then sp like spring on the rebound, um, like hit them on the break, or you can press from the front. And then it's about whether people have, uh, which I didn't see under Ollie, people are lazy or not in terms of their recovery runs if the ball gets played around them. Yeah, so it's going to be an, it's going to be an interesting little few months now. Yeah, they, they, they mentioned it on. I just very just very quickly highlighted it on on uh, Monday Night Football uh, last night about um, just the, the the German league, the Bundesliga style of football, and and, and the way coaches set their teams up in in Germany, which obviously is now kind of permeated the Premier League because there's a number mm. of German coaches and it seems to be, they seem to be fixated on preventing a counter attack against them, but then also uh, springing a counter attack extremely quickly. And I think Ranjik said something like, you know, you need to be, it's like this ultra quick transition or is this, you know, counter attack basically. If you win the ball, you've got to be in, you've got to create a chance of in eight seconds. Mm. And it's just like ultra pace, win the ball, and then complete and utterly go for it. And then the other coaches is, are setting up to try and prevent that from happening. And it's, um, mm. I guess, I don't know. Is that is that sort of real high intensity? You mentioned it with Liverpool and that. Was it was it the same? Was it was coaching? Obviously, you've done. You know, you're you're a coach, and you've gone through. You know, a lot of. You've got a lot of knowledge in that area and experience. Is is that ever been? A sort of fad or, or, or a phase where the counter attacks have been so important to coaching because that's what it seems but, like the Germans are fixated oh, well, at the moment. It's a bit, it's a bit counterintuitive in terms of how you would, um, or counterproductive. On how, I don't know how you term it on, on how you would want the players to retain possession as well. Because mm. I'll tell you, the first one to bring that in a couple of decades ago or talk about it who I actually heard talk about it, was uh, Klinsmann, Jürgen Klinsmann. Right. And it was basically, uh, they would retreat to just outside their own box and entice the opposition on. But he said when they pinched the ball back, uh, they would look to get into the opposition box within eight seconds. You know what I mean? Right, so, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, what, I mean, what happens? I mean, what, what happens if you're coming up against decent professionals, proper professionals? It's like I've, I've seen over the weekend. Um, and now I saw things with regards to um, developing at Man United. Um, and I just thought they stopped doing the professional things, as in, uh, you know, putting their foot in, leaving their foot in. Um, if it looks like they're going to get done on the break, a little bit of nous, where I used to coach players to, a lot. I was coached to stop the game. Uh, Manchester City, when I saw them against Chelsea in the League Cup final a couple of three years ago, a mate took me there. They were the governors at it. Chelsea had a, had a purple patch of about 20, 25 minutes. Every time they broke forward, they looked like they, they could open City up and City mm. just stopped the game. Um, what they called a tactical foul. Mm. So, you know, it, it, but sticking to specifics, I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, it's all very well saying that, but what happens if a tactical foul is committed? What happens if uh, you're going down and the opposition have got an overload on one side in terms of their defending setup, the mm. defensive setup, and the way they're defending with discipline, then you you would ask your players to, like John Cartwright used to say, accept defeat and turn it out and play round and go out the other side. Um, yeah, I mean it's all very well saying eight seconds, but there, there's loads of little ingredients that could prevent that. Yeah, permutations. Yeah. What what one another thing that again was interesting from last night was. Um, the Neville was sort of saying how he believes there's there's much more of an ethos with managers now and a requirement from from owners when they <laughs> decide who they recruit that they have a an ethos as opposed to and a style of football as opposed to mm. a sort of pragmatic approach and you know sort of pure flexibility to to win and horses for courses because he was saying when he was at Valencia. The first, the question he was asked all the time in, in the initial um, 
uh, press conferences and stuff was what's your idea? What's your idea about the team? What, you know, what, what, how do you want them to play? And he was saying with his upbringing playing for Man United, which is, I would say, a critique of Ferguson, but it's an interesting insight, was that they were always preoccupied with the opposition and how to prevent the opposition from, from scoring and, and winning and nullifying them. That was that. So they were very flexible. It was dependent on what, who they played, d- dictated how they played. Whereas he's saying now it's about, doesn't matter so much about how the opposition play. This is my ethos and this is, so it's just, if, if, if you, would you agree with that or? Well, I've always gone for the for the second part of what you said. Um, I, th- I think you've got to, once you get your scouting report, you've you basically modify your own game without detracting too far from it, uh, whereby you impose your game plan and your will on the opposition. Uh, having said that, you, you, I mean that sort of question. You're an idea enough in this a lose lose. You know what I mean? Mm. They, they say, "What's your ethos? How are you going to play?" You say, oh, you know, I want a high energy, high intensity, pressing from the front type of game. We're looking to win back to the ball back in the attacking third. Well, you're telling the opposition everything you're going to do. Mm. So it's a lose-lose. You can't, you know what I mean? And, and you're going to get like some wag in the, the wag journo. Like mm-hmm. I said, it's your biggest nightmare because uh, it's a supporter with a pen um, or in this case, a laptop or a, or an iPod, iPad, whatever you call them. Mm. Um it, you know, it's your worst nightmare because they, they, they can type what the, their opinion as a supporter is. Yeah. Um, but what you don't want to be doing is warning the opposition on on how you're going to play. You want it to smack them in the face, literally, like it, within the first sort of 20 minutes of a game. You think, well, you know, we didn't think this would be happening. We, we never expected this. We're, what are we going to do now? You know, in the respect that, if I can elaborate a bit, Joe, uh, mm. you, you've got a... I've always said, like, sort of what we've lacked is tactical adaptability, which seems to be getting better now at, at national level, international yeah. level, um, and, at cl- and at club level in particular, because it's an uh, academy that breeds for clubs, clubs that breed for the for the national side. Um, uh, you know, having said that, you, you want to be able to, uh, if you can change two or three times, four times during a game, to the extent where if you go a goal, two, three goals up, you, you've, you've totally blown the opposition's game plan out of the water. And it's them that's now got to look to change things. So you're affecting them. You're affecting them mentally. You're effect, affecting them the way they play their game. You're affecting them physically because they might have to do more work, um, et cetera. I mean, well, I'll tell you what was interesting. That's a, a bit of a downer on my prediction with regards to the Man United. But well, I'll tell you what, I had a little smile to myself when... Uh, they interviewed Steve Ger- Stephen Gerrard after uh, I think they, I think they got a win at Palace. Yeah. After the win at Palace, and he said about they said about how he sets up and what he's done in training to make a difference. Sort of paraphrase, but he said um, we do a lot of work on uh, to make sure that we're set up right with regards to how we defend and how uh, you know we're in contact with a person who's got the ball. He said for me the game's all about distances. Mm. <laughs> and I think yeah, myself, was... how many times how many times we said it on the yeah, on this on this absolutely. podcast and another podcast for me the game's about distances you know what I mean what happens when the ball changes hands what happens when you win the ball back um and, yeah, it's and... about distances and it's it's nice to see someone at the uh, or hear someone at the top end of the game mm. who's had a, a still you know an unbelievable career as a player done well um, gone in and made initial impacts and uh, done well in Scotland and he's come down and made a good impact down here. Yeah, it's Absolutely. nice. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, to, to well, you never know. You to reinforce your ideas. Yeah. Reinforce your ideas, and you might have known what you was talking about. Yeah. And on that distances thing, because it does. It's a nice segue, actually, or, or link to again them talking about the way Rangnick set Man United up. Obviously, they kept a clean sheet against Palace, winning one nil. I think the first clean sheet, in sixteen games. And what they was looking at was the way in which, the, again, distances of uh, Fred and McTominay. Mm. And I think it's Fernandez and maybe Ronaldo. I'm trying to think, uh, whereby they were very close together. Yeah, I would think Fernandez. Yeah, but they were both. They were like yeah. almost playing in ta- in partnerships, basically. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't move. And what they were saying was previously under Oli, you had McTominay going forward or Fred going forward, and then when there was a counter attack, they were too far apart or they weren't as a unit. Um, so is that? Do you think that's? 
would, would you say that's what distances mean having a consistent understanding of where you need to be when certain phases happen in in, in the play yeah, there's two ways to look at it joe yeah. uh, from from the, your own point of view and from the opposition point of view and that's when you need um your good players to make good decisions if you go back if people go back over the previous podcast the one before and the one before that um i was very critical of fred and mctominay yeah um and uh, but now that's obviously seems like it's been addressed Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what and it ties in with what I meant by like being the type of coach or manager that's um, needs to stand. So you need to stand on top of things. Yeah. So, the, so the point being, when I was critical of Ollie, I just said about the you know what he's bringing to the party in terms of like presence and uh, charisma and personality and imposing himself, um, sort of diminutive in stature. But then you look at someone like Conte at Spurs; he don't, he, 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 he don't stop rabbiting for 90 minutes mm, mm. you get what I mean mm. so that, that's the point I was making there and I think it's nicely highlighted by the fact that um, it, you know it doesn't matter if you you know a bit like sort of a big Ron Yates type <laughs> that yeah. sort of lump or Mickey oh, Troy yeah. you know and, and people are going to go and look up and think or well, whether you're diminutive in stature it's about you know what you articulate and um, your personality during the game and I think it was stark contrast you know what I mean because they're both around about the same stamp um, but then tying in with what I was at my first, my first, my opening gambit, you're, look, you're, you're then looking for the players to make decisions on the field. But then if you're looking at it from the opposition point of view, what you can do to spoil any game plan whereby everyone's like locking on, rushing in and pressing is to do what West Ham did do a lot mm-hmm. of the time. Um, you know, don't sort of subscribe to football snobbery and then it, Eliminate people by hitting the furthest yeah, pass forward. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. people are flying Bypassing. in and pressing. We just take the ball offline and then hit the furthest ball, and then all of a sudden that nauses their game plan. Absolutely. Exactly. And when you got someone like, um, you know, matey up front, names completely. Antonio. Antonio. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's he's a brick outhouse, isn't he? You know. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I don't know. I should have said brick shit house. We could swear on this. I should have said that. But yeah, yeah. he's he's a. But he's massively improved and he is, you know, talk about Lukaku being unplayable sometimes. I hate that phrase, by the way, but, you know, difficult to play with and, you know, yeah. a centre-half's worst nightmare. Well, Antonio has had a much better season. He's, he's, he's more impactful than, than Lukaku it's, yeah. for the moment. And who would think, you know, no one in world football, or even English football, would put Antonio in the same same bracket as Lukaku, but... Pff, he, he, yeah. He's massive to their to their way of playing, isn't he? And so difficult yeah. to stop. You know, you can't outmuscle him. You can't get in front of him. Although, although having said that, I thought Silver did really well against him. And what let Chelsea down at the weekend was the uh, people. I mean, I, I, he's been shot for three seasons, maybe more. Alonso. He mm. looks neat and tidy and elegant, and you know he's got the air and he's nice looking. He's got the nice smile when he hits the occasional volley yeah. in the far corner. But he's been shot for three years. Yeah. Uh, so because what you've got to look at from a coach's point of view is what, what, how does the player react as soon as the ball goes over his head? And yeah. um, I think you'll find for one of West Ham's goals, the he cut really well with the physicality. Silver uh, cut really well with the physicality of Antonio. Won the header, got up early, got on him. Uh, but then you're looking at the reaction of the players once the ball goes past them. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Alonso didn't deal well enough with the with the second ball. And I think the first contact was made by a West Ham player. And then it goes to, I think, Bowen. Um, it was slotted. Good finish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, why? Is, is, do you know if Chilwell's injured? Oh, no, I've got no idea. No, I've and got no idea. I, I haven't even, I haven't heard it. I've had to make three calls to get an ex-teammate's number. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, so no. I, I don't really, I don't really uh, think. And in the, in the end, I had to make, make do with a text and just well, say, I've tried to ring you three times and got the voicemail. Can you just text me? Yeah, the smoke signals out. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but it was all like, the reason I asked is I, I don't think he is. Um, I just didn't have any inside inside knowledge on it. But he, yeah. I don't. Well, it's a funny. What, what he 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 did laugh. The, you know they called Ranieri the Tinker Man when he was at Chelsea back in the day. Yeah, he did laugh. Change his team a lot. Yeah, but and that might be it. Might be to rest him. I mean, everyone was shocked he's only about, just brought him about back, the. Isn't he? Yeah, I know, but you, you you've got things coming up over the holiday period, and this I, I think Chelsea play with like, like such sort of in terms of the wing backs, they've got to be high energy. 
um, in terms of getting up and down and and uh, linking up because the pattern of play hasn't really changed that much uh, since the well Morris and Lampard and and the one before them. You know what I mean? Where yeah. they where they, they they get iron wide, this three four three malarkey. They get iron wide to engage the fullbacks, and then. Um, Come short and then and then and then spin and then get in off the line and make angle runs inside to clear the space for the fullbacks to right. get up. But as you as you rightly pointed out though, they're, they're certainly Alonso's found wanting defensively. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, think he is. Yeah. So does that does that sort of make it a little yeah. bit? You know, sort of. You, you coined the phrase jeopardy, which I love. I think it's a great word in football. But does it make it a little un, 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 unwarranted? confusion when you're constantly bringing in different fullbacks in and out i mean you look at man city they change their team all the time they very rarely change their fullbacks oh no yeah no that's yeah yeah and and, 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 and the the players whoever you bring in at that level joe should be able to deal with it yeah you know what i mean i I, honestly and truly i I don't know what he expects to get out of out of them long term what others couldn't but i don't know what his thing is about the center backs because i still think they can be like seriously got at yeah uh, Christensen and uh, Rudiger, they're having a thing at, at the moment about their respective contracts being allowed to run down. One's got 18 months left. One can go at the end of the year. Um, you know, and, unless he thinks he, they can bring something to the party. You know, I mean, the common denominator with Rudiger is the German, uh, both German speaking, both German, but the other one is uh, Christensen, who I think has been too lightweight. Mm. Um, but, you know, they, they've, they've had it, they're in a good vein of form. But it's just uh, medium and long term whether that can have a continued impact. But well, uh, maybe Tuchel's only thinking short term, like you know, he's, he's being practical. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rio Ferdinand, I heard him say that he thinks Rudiger is the best centre half in Europe. I mean, I, I found I find that strange to say the least. I really yeah. do. I think he's a, he's, he's a yeah. he's always he's always one bite, one head, but one stupid decision away from getting sent off to me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if he was a centre forward, you'd love to yeah. wind him up, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, and um, I'm pretty sure he's well paid for that opinion, Ferdinand. <laughs> yeah. It depends how profound anyone wants to go, mate. You know, we, mm. you know, this maybe we should be more superficial and get more subscribers and we get advertising money and all the rest of it, but mm. we're not. Because um, I'm, talk, I'm I looked at Ferdinand and I, I thought he had one and a half good seasons in his last seven. Mm. Um, so it depends how detailed you want to be, now, which is all they talk about now. They talk about uh, when I did it, it was almost borderline illegal. You talk about intensity, you talk about eye intensity, you talk about intensity in training, you talk about intensity in games, uh, and the managers being intense like Klopp and like Conte. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when I did it, it was almost illegal. You've got Guardiola saying, You're tired, and giving them the middle finger on the documentary. You're tired, it's cold, F you. You're tired. We've got too many games. F you. You know what I mean? And you, you think you say, well, it seems in vogue what I was doing now, yeah, 20, yeah, 25, yeah, 26 yeah, years yeah. ago. And then, and then, um, like there's the, the other side of it, the tactical, tactical side of it, they're all, they're all being revered for, for basically, just, you know, something that's been going on for ages, but it's just coming in and it's, uh, it's a foreign name and it's a foreign coach and it's in vogue and it's, it's in fashion and, um, and then the punditry is at the same time superficial. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I mean, maybe we made it wrong and not going down that route. I don't know. I don't know what to say other than other than uh, other than like it, for me that is uh, borderline sensationalist. Saying yeah, that really yeah, yeah. the best centre back in in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. it's, it's, it's PR and spin again, isn't it? And I suppose they say it because they want to be. I don't know, you know, it's, it's sort of jumping on a bandwagon to, to, to you know, the, the, the best phrase, but it's it's about not want, you know, saying what people want to hear, essentially. Yeah. Because it's it's being too controversial splits opinion, but you don't get followers on Twitter splitting opinion or, you know. Get yeah. Re- well, get, get listen, what you've contracts. got to do is, I think what is, I mean, going back to him, uh, uh, Gerard at Villa, what he's, he's looked at it and he's gone in and he's, is well so far created an environment that that the players are buying into. Um, you know, you, it, it doesn't matter what club you're at. You, the, the way it look it looks these days to me, uh, nothing's really changed. If you if you've got good players with a decent human beings, you've got a chance. I was doing I, I was analysing the game on on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, 
And then I uh, was turning and fram with somebody. What do you think about? He's, he's asking me about his club. Um, I think it might well have been West Ham. And I, and I just said, look, what it boils down to is, you know, if you've got like decent players and, and they're decent people, you've always got a chance. Then all you've got to factor in is the organisation. You know what I mean? The, 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 it's getting rid of the Lenny. I used to call them Lenny letdowns. <laughs> you know what I mean? They promised so much. And then uh, I made a mistake of signing a couple. You know what I mean? One I bought back out of, or, you know, he was homeless. And I've, 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 I've sort of basically resur- like, resurrected. He just helped him with his life off the field mm-hmm. for an ex-teammate and turned out a massive letdown. You know, so... It's, uh, you've always, if you've got decent people, you've, you've always got a chance. I found in, in my uh, limited experience uh, for a not very long time and unable to get my own players in, that um, eight, eight is not enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? You need, you need uh, and, and like you're talking about, when you're bringing people in, you're chopping and changing, you need people in who are chomping at the bit. So, because it's no, it's no good if you're looking to bring in fresh legs which is fundamentally what it's all about, rotating your squad. It's just to bring in uh, a burst of energy and fresh legs. And someone mm. might have been suspended or, or gone out of form, but, but normally this time of year, looking to give them a rest, um, they've got to be chomping at a bit and they've got to be decent professionals. As in, you know, we know they're good players, but they've, uh, they've got a point to prove as in they shouldn't have been left out the side or... Yeah. They've got a point to prove to, they just want to reiterate what a good player and underline what good players they are and good professionals they are. Um, and as much as anything, pride. Yeah. Right. It's um, just looking at Chelsea now. What, what's your, I mean, I always ask, I always ask you, what's your predictions for the season? But obviously they're, you know, there's, there's, there's two points between them and Man City at the top of the league. Yeah, not 30, a lot 30, in 30, it is. 30, 30, 30, it's them three. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that going for the league. But do you, I feel was there something not quite right at Chelsea? Uh, um, I've always said, and that's how I've always said it, Joe. And uh, uh, I think West Ham highlighted it fantastically. Well, is is the space behind the fullbacks? If you look yeah. at the couple of the goals, uh, again, it's it boils down to whether you you're not going to take any notice of football snobbery, and whether you're going to defeat the game plan by doing something a little bit different. Yeah. And I thought um, there's no shame whatsoever in going a little bit more direct into an area where you think that the opposition might be vulnerable. And I, and I honestly Absolutely. believe that that clip into the channel, when um, if the, when the ball changes hands, what they again, what they call transition, but I would be saying that as soon as the ball changes hands, you get it out of your feet because they're going to be pushed iron wide. Mm. The space is going to be... Etc. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, that, and that's and and so it came to pass. And 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 to begin with, Chelsea dealt with it quite well. Um, but he what he does, what he does really well is um, he busts a gut to get there. Antonio, mm. he busts, he absolutely gives his all for the team to get there in terms of making up the ground. Because what you would want is in an ideal world, if you're going to go with like like three defenders or three centre-backs and your full-backs are pushed iron wide, I, mm-hmm. in an ideal world, the, the centre-backs shouldn't have too much running to do if they're thinking about it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the second thing is they should be in there waiting. So ideally what you would want is you, uh, if we're going down our left, their right, like it was for one of West Ham's goals, as soon as the ball changes hands, you would want the centre-back actually waiting in, the, in there um for it so so ergo, covering that position slightly wide right. so ergo yeah, yeah mark, marking on the outside right yeah and then as the ball's clipped into the channel you're actually almost in, in there waiting for it what i found was there was a lot of times where they were trying to make up the ground getting dragged and, get, out and get into the area because they've been yeah. dragged out or they've been involved in the build-up play and they've been too lazy and shuffling over because there's a there's a lot there's a yeah. lot of things there's a lot of decisions you have to make if you if you're a good defender if you're a good centre back or any in any position there's a lot of decisions you have to make um, and you should be making while the ball's quite a long way away yeah 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 yeah, yeah and I see anticipated. too many I see too yeah. many players that don't so it's like when you're coaching you don't just look at the ball and the area where the ball is and who's on the ball and what's happening with the ball. You've got to, you've got to have a general overview and you you might have to, even though you're coaching the situation there, you might also have to remind someone there, there, there and there. 
You understand mm. what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah, I do. I do. So just so just look, fellas, just so we're nice. If it ball, if the, if it breaks down there, you've got to cater for the worst case scenario. Mm. Mm. You understand? Mm. So yeah. you're, you're coaching there, but you're also coaching now. Uh, 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 you don't stray off a topic or you don't stray off a subject, but you just sometimes have to give a little nudge and little reminders. And I, mm. either the coaches are doing it and the players are not taking any notice or the coaches ain't doing it and the players are not taking any notice or the coaches are doing it and the players are being too lazy. It's an interesting one because it seems to me like what you're saying is that the centre-half, certainly the wide, the two on the outside, uh, which I guess would be Rudiger and Christensen, almost have to think like a, like a fullback because they haven't necessarily got the fullback there or the wing back there to cover them. So well, they, well, often they haven't, if there's a, if there's a uh, turnover or whatever, change the ball, changing hands, and there's a quick counter-attack. And, and is that sometimes uh, difficult for someone that is a, just a true centre-half where they think like a centre-half and they get in positions of, of nah. a centre-half as opposed nah. to... Because nah. essentially what he's saying is you need to cover that position, you need to cover that nah. fullback position. No, shouldn't be. It shouldn't, shouldn't be. be. No. Yeah, I mean, I, the the problem, what what it looked like to me is, um, apart from Silver, the decisions. This is where I don't get the, the comment you said with regards to Fer, what Ferdinand said about Rudiger. At the end mm. of the day, you just got to be looking over your shoulder because the key is to be in the right area, but also to remain compact. I see that they were trying to make up too much ground, and you've got to bear in mind this. It's, it's explosive, quicker. you know what yeah, I mean. So yeah, yeah. It, it's it's already happened. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, decent decent centre backs who read the game well, they they're, they're being there waiting, mm-hmm. and they'd also be looking across and checking, and vice versa. Silver should be screaming at them to to come in, but Mark on the outside, and maybe tell Silver get tucked round. I'm I'm going to deal with this. You tuck round, and then Silver in turn says to someone like Christian, says, "Get get round, tuck round." So you you're inviting the opposition. If you're going to look to penetrate, they're basically your best option if you want to retain the ball, is to go the long route, mm. which buys you time. Because defending is all, is all about economy of effort. And, it, it, and you, the best exponent of that, or proponent of that, is Van Dijk, isn't it, at Liverpool, where he's always in the right position. And he, he, he conserves his energy. And him and Matip are, are well, seemingly a very good, wonderful partnership. And, and and always seem to be in the right place when it comes to covering Alexander Arnold and Robertson, the bomb on, and that's only two of them. Yeah, I think because he, he's a good, apart from being a, a, a very good, he's got all the attributes and a superb player. I think he's very vocal, Joe. Yeah, you've got to bear, you've got to bear in mind when you like you're bossing each other, it makes the game so much easier. Yeah. I found that to my cost. Yeah, you know when I, when I come into into the side at Chelsea as a, as a kid. Um, I was probably I was in awe of the people around me to a large degree, mm-hmm. and uh, when when basically I should have been bossing them to make the game easier for me. Yeah, and it's fa- it's funny. I read an article yesterday about uh, they were talking about uh, someone who's a twenty year old putting them in. I think it's Everton, and they're and they're struggling up front. Uh, Dominic Calvert Lewin, uh, he's he's injured, so they're bringing about talking about bringing the Turkish geezer back. That, I think Sam Allardyce brought him in. That's how long ago that is. Hosting, isn't it? Yeah, and he, yeah. he's been out of sorts, and uh, I think he's a free at the end of the season. And then he, his next um, available forward is a twenty-year-old, and he's and and Rafa Benitez. I was laughing. I was literally laughing out loud as I was reading the article. He said, "I don't really want to uh, bring a twenty-year-old into into such a, a, a toxic atmosphere. I don't want to bring a twenty-year-old into this, uh, you know, sort of volatile situation where." Um, he's implying that like more senior players should have taken responsibility and Everton shouldn't be in this situation mm. X amount of games without a win. I'm thinking, fuck me. I wish you'd have been around when I, <laughs> when I was thrown in at Chelsea and yeah. as a 19 year old and you know, we, we never had a forward in the club. We couldn't, we couldn't score on a stag night in, in, in a brothel in Amsterdam or Thailand. And uh, that's how bad it was. No goals once Steve Finiston left. Um, or spoken to recently because I speak very highly of him in my book. Um, once Ray Wilkins left, didn't want the ball. No one wanted the ball because uh, he was the only one along the, alongside uh, people like David A who wanted the ball. Once they left, uh, he went, went to Man United, Ray. Rest in peace. Um, we, we was always destined to struggle. And I still, for the life of me, in my, uh, slightly in my defence, even if it had panned out that I wouldn't have been good enough, big, basically big enough or quick enough, um, I still think to myself, well, you know, 
how, how many uh, could have coped with the situation that mm. he's thrown into, <laughs> expecting like two 18, 19 year old centre backs to to get a club out of trouble. And here you are latter day, you've got uh, people talking about players' mental health and toxic atmospheres and volatility and bringing them into a losing side and bringing them into a situation where we're not creating chances. I'm like, oh, oh my days. Yeah, could have done could, yeah. could have done with uh, Rafa the gaffer around at that time. It's so, so damaging, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. it is. And, 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 and only, uh, you know, when you've put your life and your heart and soul into something, uh, only you know personally how damaging it is, mm. Mm. because obviously I'm I'm still I still reflect on it now and then get on with me day, but it's to live and to learn. Yeah, well I suppose that's a positive. I mean, unfortunately, you're you know one of the the reason maybe the reasons along with other players why why that's changed and why they are thinking more about young players' well being because whilst you can you know put ten percent on your levels and and embrace if you if you go into the right if you get blooded and, and blooded yeah, yeah. to the first team in the right way you can want to do really well yeah but, but it's, alternatively it can go the other way yeah. and that's obviously what happened. you know it's, oh it's, yeah it's for quite, sure it can it's, it's you want to be in a situation there you go son have a feel of the ball just well, just share it on Enjoy get it yourself, back yeah. share it on yeah just mm. thing and then start bossing people in front of you it's like i, I, I mean i'm looking i'm thinking am i how can i scream at ray wilkins to come and screen the front <laughs> you know what I mean, and uh, bollock Mickey Droy for being so far away. They could have, you could have driven a, a fleet of Sherman tanks up the middle. one. this is a this is a Ibury when we got hammered five two. I mean, I was with Ray because uh, we had an attack and someone hit a poor crossing, and I think it was Pat Jennings gathered it, and he he threw it out to Liam Brady where I thought we should have been pushed higher up and locked on. You know what I mean? And it, so you had me doing that, and you had Mickey doing that. And uh, Ray said, we, sh- we should be pushing in. We should be squeezing up. Oh, uh, so it was action. like that. Yeah, it was, so, it, it, that, it was a reflection of the times. It was all off the cuff. There yeah, was no, yeah. There was no, I, I didn't really have any strategy until uh, George Petty came, came on to the, after I left Chelsea, on to the training field at Millwall. And then uh, again, under the coach I was at Loggerheads with at Chelsea, which was Brian Eastick, when he came to Lake Norrin and we got promoted. Because of his structure and organisation, yeah. So, so it doesn't matter. So the point being, it doesn't matter how the level you're playing at and how good a player you are. Um, a, that should be the case, and B, you need reminders. Yeah. So you see, that's what you see in the so-called top managers, the successful managers. You, you're uh, like it's like someone like Simeone or Conte who's just come out, and they've had they've had a, they've had a right result. I think they've had a right result. And then and then you need fate and luck to play a part because I think that Burnley game getting called off done them a favour because mm. they weren't very convincing in the game before. They weren't even convincing. The scoreline suggests otherwise, but they weren't even convincing over the weekend. But the uh, the way he's trying to get them to play, I thought they uh, give them another week or another five days to work with the players. And I thought that was a right result, the snow coming down up north. Yeah. Well, yeah. Imagine if that to play at a snow, a snowy night in Burnley. It's the last yeah. team you want to play, isn't it, really? When you're, when, you're, when you're fragile defensively, yeah, pro- I mean, yeah, probably, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, yeah. He must be, he must be very comfortable there. I'm, I'm shocked that he ain't tried elsewhere, Dice. He must be really comfortable there and have he, his feet, like you know, really firmly under the table there. Well, I guess he, he calls the shots, doesn't he? And it, it's yeah. interesting. I, I saw again with, with Benitez. Um, apparently, the owner loves Benitez, despite. Bill, uh, Bill Kenwright not wanting uh, Benitez to be anywhere near the club because of his connections with Liverpool. And he's quite a divisive character. But he, now the, the, the director of football's gone at Everton, he, he kind of, he went a couple of days ago and they asked Benitez on the, on the interview and he said he didn't know anything about it. But Carragher said, from what he understands, he's out with him. Benitez has got rid of him because he's... Yeah, that's right. And he thinks the next 100%. one will be the top of the... Um, well, you can see that from as well. Yeah. You can so see it from out of space, Joe. Yeah, yeah. They've, had a, they've had a chat behind the scenes and he's just gone, there's just too many players who are not good enough and who's yeah. done the recruitment. I can't mm. have this. I've got to be in charge of my own destiny, which is yeah. 100%, 100% how it should be. Mm. I think Moyes has done the same yeah, at West Ham. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you yeah. understand? I think yeah. he said, look, calm down. 
the only time it should be in the thing, you need to calm yourself down. You're too, you're, you're, you're putting your head above the parapet a bit too much. You're too high profile to the owners. Oh, yeah. we're going to sign in. We're going to sign in. We've inquired for the, you don't do that. You no. don't do that. It's not how you conduct your business. You do it. You get it signed and sealed. And the, the you know, the briefs have like rubber stamped it. And then you've got the photo holding the shirt up once mm, the deal's mm, done. Mm, mm, so there's mm. no, you know I mean? You don't ridicule yourself. No. And I think what's happening with him, he's had, they've had a little meeting behind closed doors and he's gone, look, and then now they're saying he's going to, which I've said, you could see it from out of space on previous podcasts. I don't get that. It will be 35 million. I don't, what's that about? 25 million, whatever the fuck he was. I, I don't, I don't get it. You could get any player like that in non-league. I do not get it. And now he's looking for offers for him. Well, all the best. All the best, and yeah. some and so and the the, the Turk we brought back in, um, and then and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else, and he even mentioned Coleman the other week. You know what I mean? So the list is as long as you're on. But I think someone went through the sums uh, when it was breaking news on Match of the Day too on Sunday night. Something like a third of a billion pounds been spent by this geezer. Yeah, I think well, according to the Match of the Day, it's, it's over five hundred mil. Maybe net spend, I think it was about three hundred and fifty million. The actual gross spend is, is is over half a billion. Yeah. So what's the point? It's like I've always said. What's, there's no, there's no. There's someone said that about the thing at Leighton Orient. Oh yeah, where well, yeah, Pete has spent one point eight million, right, which in their terms is phenomenal amount of money. Twenty six mm. years ago, but he recouped one point three. I said, well, what's the point if four go down and we're fifth from bottom? Mm, yeah, All this yeah. net spend is the biggest myth in the game. Mm. One of them. One of yeah. them. Mm. It's probably probably ten myths in the game, big myths in the game. And that's one of them. The net spend's one of them. It's the biggest load of cobblers you've ever heard. Well, yeah. To be fair to Benitez, and I'm sure Townsend and Gray were his signings, but he's got Townsend on a free and he got Gray for a yeah. million, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's just and I, was, I, I said when, when we was doing the thing with what's with uh, with Don and, and, and Alan when, mm. when you was there, we we doubt said about him, someone should be looking at him. Couple of we took going back a couple of years. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I nick him for a meal. Um, I think it's a touch. Unbelievable. I mean, he won on the game yesterday. Yeah. Um, against a very lackluster Arsenal again. You know, they're, they're becoming Spursy. I think, I think we've, we've spoken about that on previous yeah. podcasts, but, you know, it's uh, a weak underbelly and, and a lot of players that aren't living up to expectations at Thomas Party. I mean, coming from Italy, big bossing sort of Vieira type centre midfielder. Absolutely nowhere to be seen. And he was doing the hiding thing where he was telling centre halves not to pass to him. And White, that was bollocking him. Well, White was bollocking him all the time to say, You're not showing for the ball. Yeah. Why are we really? That's what I should have done. Yeah. I, I, I played with a midfield player who never demanded the ball once in every every team we played in. He, he had, he had uh, just under 500 games Jeez. in what's now the Premier League. Never demanded the ball once, not white, and hid, hid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. he's revered. He's revered. Good luck to him. I know the truth. I've got my own truth. I know the truth. And it's nothing but the truth. And at the end of the day, I think it's, I think it's shocking. Had Did it, you ever it, fancy just wrapping it into him anyway? After some of that? Yeah, yeah some, sometimes you did. I mean, it happened in Southeast Counties 2, Southeast Counties 1, football combination in the first team. And uh, the best, the, the, the one that I liked, it was uh, an Amarin. And it's only, it's only you think to yourself, you know what? It's almost as if you can live with yourself a little bit better. It was a 6 0 Amarin at Nottingham Forest who were, who were basically, I think they'd already been European champions and they were going for it again. I thought I mentioned it before on a few occasions. Mm. And, it, and he, he's uh, someone I spoke to a couple of days ago, Graham Wilkins. He got topped in the first five minutes by Trevor Francis and I got topped in the last five minutes. Like, like my knee was all over the gaff. I went past. Uh, clough in the thing with a bandage as big as your head around me, around me knee and an ice pack. And he just said, it was men against boys, I'm afraid. And I remember Trevor Aylott not having a touch. He never had a touch the whole game. Larry Lloyd and Burns, they must have had a cigar and a brandy and cheese and biscuits. And the midfield totally overran our midfield. And on top of that, there's, there's me, I think me and Mickey Nutton got to deal with Woodcock and uh, who's the other one? Bertles. <laughs> <laughs> Two kids trying to, do, yeah, because yeah. Happy, fucking European happy, champions. Happy days, yeah. I yeah. Felt, uh, it felt like uh, the Battle of Balaclava. Or the, what's the yeah. other one? <laughs> Battle of Somme. Yeah. yeah, Battle of Spear and Cup. Yeah, um, yeah it's. Uh... Yeah, I just I thought, how you got away with it? 
mate, it, it's <laughs> a, in, this, a in his case, it was a, it, it was one of two extremes, either like sheer front and loud, right, or in his case, very quiet and stayed out of the way, never said a word, and just sat back and watched. Yeah, yeah, How fascinating. How yeah, fascinating. yeah, yeah. But it's it's this is it's, 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 it's going on then, and it's still going on now. Yeah, survival, mate. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, but I've always been at a thing you're either all in or all out. Yeah, you understand yeah, yeah, what I yeah. mean? Once you've got the in between us, <laughs> um, God, no, that's yeah. fascinating. That really is. It is because they're the ones that obviously aren't going to be there when you need them. Yeah, they're the ones that melt first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> and then uh, I'll come across. I'll come across. Uh, it's funny. It's fair. Six degrees of separation, whatever they call it. I'll come across. Uh, uh, because he's he's quite thing in um, he plays quite a large large part in the documentary. I believe in miracles, so I end up with him as my manager, Frank Clark, and um, and then I've, I've I've met quite a few times on quite a few occasions. Uh, uh, Boya, in Boya, who's a lovely, lovely, lovely man, very right, sartorially, right. very elegant, but he's to- right. he totally crucified our midfield. He's Boya on his own. You know what I mean, Martin O'Neill? You come across. Yeah. You tell me, what, you you completely outplayed us. What do you do in training? It goes it goes on to be a multi millionaire and managing a national side. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but no, but you got the, the the thing. If you've got no cutting edge, it's no good. What you do in training? No, plenty of managers come out of that, and I suppose he had a good eye for that cloth, didn't he? You know, characters and uh, people that would run for a brick wall. He obviously, he brought Keane over from Ireland. You know, yeah. Yeah, constantly reinventing, wasn't he? Yeah, as if you've got the power and the clap to do that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, what I, what I see there is, uh, I mean, I, the other one is they're still they're both still in the thing of the, the other two predictions: surprise packages, Spurs and West Ham. When you ask me about them, mm. so you never know. It's about consistency and belief. Okay, all right. Well, well, I think we should leave it there, John. That was a good little, right, uh, good little catch up. Really, is what it was. And yeah. um, as you say, it was sow the seeds for. Well, what's what, what, what's going to be a very busy December? An exciting. I'll December. be honest, Joe. I'm going to be honest. I love this time of year as a player. Yeah, really. I yeah. really did. But they're all mm. moaning about it now. Mm. They're all moaning about it now, and they're going on about the the thing. And very quickly, the two there's two things that come out. Right. One was um, the thing Gerard in his interview distances. Yeah. So I think to myself, so I had a little chuckle to myself. That actually free. I had a little chuckle to myself. Uh, and yet again, find myself saying, "Well, you never know. You know, I might have known what I was talking about." Yeah, uh, still know the what thing, you're talking about the, the the thing with regards to um, uh, shielding players. He, he said he's loath, reluctant to throw yeah. in a young centre forward. Yeah, uh, and I thought to myself, "Well, if only you'd have known the environment that, that was knocking about at the bridge <laughs> when I was a kid." Uh, but you know, the third thing, very quickly, oh, yeah, um, someone done an article, and I thought to myself. Hallelujah. Like how many, how long have I been saying this? So I'm talking decades now, right? Uh, actually reducing the amount of games in the lower divisions, right? Warburton's come up with this uh, bright idea at QPR, which I've been saying for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, uh, yet again, right? Uh, and go back through interviews, go back through podcasts, go, go back through my book. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll read it or you'll hear it. Um, about reducing the amount of numbers uh, in the in the respective divisions, and then bringing them down to the thing, and then the journalist has taken it a step further, tying in with what I also said. Uh, so there's absolutely no reason whatsoever years ago why we shouldn't have four divisions under the Premier League, reduce them to 20 teams, but include the top six or eight teams in the in the national conference. Mm. Lo and behold. That's what they're talking about doing now because it's, it, detra- yeah. it detracts from the quality of the football with regards to player fatigue, uh, supposedly. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing maybe maybe it's fatigue, maybe it ain't, maybe... Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, well, I'll be honest, I'm looking, I just said it on a number of occasions, there's, there's players playing in the lower divisions, particularly I look at the defensive side, they wouldn't have got in my Sunday side um, with some of their decision-making and the way they look around to blame other people and how disorganised it looks uh, or poor application. Um, what they're saying is, uh, to take it to the next stage, like I said, it gives uh, coaches and managers, which I think will find that it's sort of the wheat from the chaff because qualifications 
as the driving in London proves, qualifications mean absolutely nothing, right? It's whether, the, whether they've got the nous, the personality, the charisma mm. and the knowledge to impart, to improve people. But mm. what it will do, it will give coaches more time with players. More time, yeah, yeah. All right? So that, that's all, that's all that's coming it. out now. Stuff that I've been saying for decades. Fascinating, that. Fascinating, yeah. that. It's yeah, like yeah, a yeah. breeding I, ground. It's like, a, it's like a, just giving them a bit more time to learn their craft and improve. Not just smashing out games left, right, and center, and just recovery, play a game, recovery, play a game. Because that's just keeping your head above the water, isn't it? You're not building yeah. a. Yeah, you're not. You're not. You're not foundation. A, no, and you're not. You're not improving individuals or the units or the team. No, it's you know I mean, you're, all you're doing is just muddling your way through from one game to the next. And it's what I said years mm. ago, and I've said it on many occasions. I don't see absolutely no reason whatsoever why the championship can't be reduced. Um, to tw- like 20 teams, so 38 games, and then, um, and and I'll be honest with you, the other the other thing which uh, I predicted, um, you would have heard it here first. I said uh, when they talk about this, it's funny, like they say, nah, I can't really, but then all of a sudden they pull out all the stops to try and win it, the League Cup. So if it's called if it's called the Football League Cup or the EFL Cup, then just let league teams take part in it. Mm. So then they get, that gives more rest to the Premier League and international players within the Premier League. You know what I'm saying? got to compete Absolutely. in it. And then yeah. it's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing that uh, probably their best chance ever of, of a, league, a league side breaking into Europe. And it's still a big cup. You know, it's, even if it wasn't Premier League players, you know, to be Premier League teams in it, sorry. You know, to, to, it's still championship teams. Yeah. It's still a, it's still a pretty elite oh, yeah. or, cup to or, win. Listen... Or, or even lower down, because I was sitting there shell shocked and thinking, how the F did that happen? Even I was only ten, and I, I was nearly crying when. Um, and a fu- it's funny the six degrees of separation again. I come across him because uh, uh, Bobby Gold is uh, is number two at Chelsea, playing for Arsenal against Swindon, who were third division at the time. <laughs> right. So it can happen. You understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. I do. Uh, oh, and also the FA Cup would the the, the top teams would really put all their efforts into the FA Cup because the only unless you're in the Champions League and you're at Europa Cup you've got the Premier League and the FA Cup that's all you'd have yeah because yeah, the FA that, Cup's fallen by the way it's that, con- it's that constant contradiction where you know when you've got the managers worth like 40 million going to watch cricket in Dubai after getting sacked I never understood two things why his uh, club took him on and then allowed him uh, two three weeks off to go and watch the cricket in the West Indies as in ex-teammate of mine, Brucey, but then when he was manager at Newcastle, why they don't pull out all the stops to try and challenge for a bit of silverware mm, mm, instead of mm. which said FA Cup and, and League Cup, they're, they're resting players. What's that about? You know what I mean? It's your only chance. You ain't going to win the league. It's your only chance. They might do now with, with a few Nelsons, but, but then that tells me um, Eddie Howe's going to be a stopgap. If they're going to start throwing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions at it, that tells me that they're going to wait for a bigger name. Well, it's the Mark Hughes thing, isn't it, Man City? It was yes, the last. yes, yes. Yeah, not the first time it's happened, won't be the last. All right, well, uh, let's see how it pans out. Of, uh, hopefully we'll do one next week. If not, we'll see how we go, but we'll definitely do another one. And yeah. uh, we'll just keep going, John. And, yeah, it's uh, just to apologise to everyone, but it's busy times. Yeah. It's busy yeah. times, yeah. And we're, we're working we're working, men. Absolutely. All right, well, uh, as always, everyone, questions i haven't had a question from from the followers for a while please send them in like subscribe retweet um, and we'll see you anon spread the gospel absolutely cheers guys cheers joe